I want to first start on this um, almost historic day where Kabul has fallen, helicopter is over US embassy, the United States doesn't look doing very well in Afghanistan, and of course we can't support the Taliban, they are a reactionary force. And I want to start by um, explaining some very basic facts, because I think unless we start from the same um, if you like, uh, basic, um, what, what I think are uh, characteristics of Iran's Islamic Republic, we can't understand the Cold War, hot war with um, Israel. So I want to start by saying that as far as not just me, but I think rational thought is concerned, Iran's Islamic Republic can't be considered an anti-imperialist country. It is uh, totally um, involved, integrated in the neoliberal economic system. And because of that, in a way, sanctions are so effective against it because uh, it is part of the global uh, capital in some ways. Um, I would also argue that quite a lot of Iran's anti-US slogans or more rhetoric or more slogans. It is the only thing that has been, if you like, the only relic of the revolutionary era. Uh, there's nothing else the Islamic Republic can link itself to in terms of 1979. The class divide is far worse. There is no democracy. There is no um, equality of um, opportunity, even never mind. Um, uh, class uh, uh, equality and so on. So it has nothing left. And it is because of that that the anti-US slogans are quite significant for the regime. But I don't think at this stage in 2021, almost 43 years after it has come to power, we can say that the Islamic Republic's supporters, its um, leaders, or its opponents actually believe much of Iran's rhetoric against the US or against, um, it never uses the term imperialism, what it calls is Western arrogance. So uh, people really don't believe that. The only people who believe it as far as I can see are the deluded analysts that uh, foreign Persian speaking, but foreign press and media, both BBC, Voice of America, but also Saudi Israeli Persian speaking media, uh, we laughed every now and then to explain about Iran. Um, there are four significant times when Iran has tried to, if you like, uh, ingratiate itself to the United States. And in some ways, you could say it's the United States that doesn't want um, any alliance with Iran. And there are good reasons for this. If you again look back at the Kabul um, Afghanistan scenario, the last time uh, most of us think of the scenario of 1975 and the Saigon helicopter over the US embassy. But for a lot of US politicians, the scenario that is almost as nightmarish, as uh, awful as this one, is in fact the um, 19. Uh, 80 hostage taking in Tehran. So I know it's amazing that a, that a superpower should be so obsessed by vengeance, but the United States is as a superpower, um, really driven very often by vengeance. And that's why the approaches by Iran haven't really worked. So what were these approaches? Well, first of all, uh, I think by 2016, we had the Khomeini letter to the uh, Carter administration declassified, and it showed how the regime during those first few months after the Shah had left was trying to get closer to the United States. There was almost a, 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 a discussion about transfer of power, which eventually did happen. In the late 80s, we had Iran Gate with all its consequences, hostages released for money and so on. But I think the two significant periods in the 21st century are 2001 and 2003. 
the uh, um, uh, recordings we have, both um, by people like Ryan Crocker, the US uh, envoy, but also by Iranian generals, are very clear that Iran was very trying its best to be as helpful as possible during the invasion of Afghanistan. Whether the Taliban will forgive Iran for those uh, um, you know, plans that it showed the US military for attacking Afghanistan, no, I don't know. But it definitely is clear that Iran went out of its way uh, to help the US invasion of Afghanistan. Iran and the Taliban were almost at war with each other the summer before the 2001 invasion. This is partly because Iran was supporting the Northern Alliance, the people who later um, were not the president and the uh, semi-elect president, but the actual warlords that were the backup to the so-called pro-West Afghan government. And then in 2003, Iran did its best to help the US efforts in the Iraq war. Um, it refused to return Saddam's warplanes that were in Iran because uh, Saddam had sent them for safety. But uh, it, it, at, by, on the Iraq war, Iran was uh, looking forward and indeed was um, uh, 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 be benefited from the coming to power of its main allies in the Iraqi capital. And that stayed on until today. Even as we speak, the Iraqi government in all of its factions, in the very various forms that it takes, remains much closer to Iran than anywhere else, and is certainly better for Iran than Saddam Hussein. But having done all of these things for the US, I don't think the US ever wanted Iran as an ally. And in fact, the, if you like, the axis of evil speech of George Bush put an end to any attempt by Iran to try and uh, consider itself friendly with US. But that's only uh, to explain what I was trying to say in terms of US Iran relations and the anti-US slogans of the Islamic Republic. I think one thing that has stayed throughout this period, and in a way plays part also in the whole US-Iran conflict, is the Iran-Israeli conflict. And here we are talking of a situation where <clears throat> um, there is both rivalry and animosity. And there are very good reasons for this. In some ways, the two countries are, have many characteristics in common. They are both religious states of one kind or another. They both nuclear power. Iran is not fully a nuclear power, but is close to getting um, nuclear um, level um, enrichment of uranium. And um, Iran's population, as a young computer literate uh, population, with its IT industry, both internally, but also IT industry that uh, has connections to US IT industry, um, can be, isn't, but can be a rival to Israeli um, IT industry. And if you like, in terms of the countries of the region, the development of the means of production are at a similar level between Iran and Israel. Um, and in, in some ways that explains um, how um, this rivalry and this animosity go hand in hand. As in the case of US, the anti-Israeli slogans aren't there just because um, the US, uh, be, just because um, of uh, historic reasons. It's partly a very advantageous for the regime. It's advantageous for the regime because it doesn't want to um, say we've given up on everything we stood for in 1979. So we are corrupt. 
okay, it's no less, it, it, most Iranians will tell you the current situation is far more corrupt than 19, uh, the pre Shah period. It's more systematic, it's more uh, in depth uh, corruption. Uh, it's less equal, definitely, poverty, the gap between rich and poor, or more, and so on. But it can say that in some ways, um, we've kept some of the slogans, and anti Israel is one of them. Um, and I suppose some of them might still have remnants of what I would call a support for the Palestinian cause. But to be honest, you have seen so much duplicity, lies from the leaders of this government uh, that most Iranians would doubt it. And I'm personally very doubtful about it as well. What we can say is that the rivalry and the animosity between Iran and Israel has been um, such that probably at least since 2002, I'm not sure 2001, but at least 2002, when the war with Iraq became um, poss a possibility, it was mentioned as a possibility, the Israeli government and Zionist lobby in the US, the neoconservatives in the Republican Party have continuously argued uh, for a war against Iran, a US war against Iran. And they haven't been hiding it. It's not a secret. It's not something we don't know. In 2003, people like John Bolton and the, um, the neocons were saying, in some ways, this is the wrong overthrow. We should have overthrown Iran's Islamic Republic. In 2015, 2016, Israel was in the forefront of the lobby opposing any nuclear negotiation. And I suppose there is little doubt that the best time for Netanyahu Israel was the Trump era. And that was the time when we saw this Cold War getting into a bit of a hot war, because the aim was that hopefully he would incite Iran to do something uh, that would justify a full war, a military war. Both Moshe and I were following this week, on, week in, week out. And there were times when you really thought uh, they are hoping. They're hoping some broke revolutionary guard group, some proxy of Iran, the Iranian government itself, would go to war, would do something, and that would allow a war, a full war in the Middle East. Uh, this became more intense towards the end, as I would, towards the end of the Trump era, and also towards the end of the Netanyahu era. In both times, we can see the hotting up of these situations. And of course, Iran's involvement in Syria, which I think is, um, uh, has many issues there, um, uh, many issues to debate about, but in, on the other hand, you could say Iran's involvement um, wasn't, very often was not necessary and went beyond what the claim was, which was to make sure Al Qaeda doesn't get to the borders of Iran. But that involvement itself increased tension and made the, if you like, both the aggression of uh, uh, the US Israeli alliance more pronounced, but also. Uh, allow targets for this, as we will see later. <clears throat> there were other, apart from inciting wars, there were um, inciting conflict, military conflict. There were also other efforts. A number of uh, Iranian nuclear scientists were assassinated in mid uh, to 2015, 2016. And the last one was, um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the, uh, in 2020, which I will explain a bit more later. And of course, we had the assassination of Soleimani, very strange situation for a very long time. The United States was uh, claiming, or at least the US press and media were claiming him to be the general who defeated Daesh, uh, ISIS in um, the Middle East, Iraq and Syria. But at the same time, they disliked him quite clearly, and he was assassinated in Iraq, as you know. 
the claim by the Israelis is that it was the intelligence that they got either via spies or via whatever uh, electronic means that allowed them to, um, that helped the US assassination plot. I mentioned spies and we have to talk about that. So the two countries have a lot of spies and I think here Israel has been a lot more successful. The first time, time I heard about Mossad's spies within Iran's Islamic security system was in early 2000. Um, most of you would probably not know but there were serial political murders in Iran of um, intellectuals, writers. Uh, most of them left wing. Um, some of us were very involved at the time and uh, a DVD arrived from Iran which showed the interrogation of the wife of a senior Iranian security agent, Saeed Imami, um, who was Allegedly, and this was, you could listen to every faction of the Islamic Republic, you might get the complete wrong answer or right answer from this whole situation. But the accusation was that rogue elements within the Ministry of Intelligence had uh, participated in these assassinations without the permission of the state. I certainly have never believed this version. But anyway, the DVD was interesting in that other Islamic Republic security people were accusing this woman, were actually beating her up to confess that she and her husband worked for Mossad. And this was the first time I came to the face to face, if you like, with the accusations that Mossad has agents within the Islamic Republic of Iran. Said Imami was a senior member of the uh, intelligence security system. He later uh, uh, allegedly committed suicide in Avian prison, one of the most secure prisons in Iran. And uh, it was clear somebody killed him. Um, whether he worked for Mossad or not, I am not even going there because I don't think you can believe any of these people's comments. But what is important in this event and the, uh, and the fact that so many other um, Israeli uh, spies have worked within the ranks of the Islamic Republic is the uh, comments by both Iran's former Minister of Intelligence, Younesi, but also agreed by, by Cohen, the outgoing Mossad um, director, that uh, large numbers of spies were working for Israel. And UNESCO's comments are very interesting because uh, he says, um, um, his comments is that the more uh, sycophantic they were, the more radical they claimed to be, the more likely they were to be spies. And, this is interesting because throughout the last few years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, Iran has executed or arrested and forced confessions for a large from a number of political opponents, none of whom had anything to do with any foreign power. The first accusation has been you're a CIA agent, you're a Mossad agent. And very clearly, uh, one shouldn't seek the uh, uh, spies or the agents within the workers' movement in Iran, the women's movement in Iran, but within the ranks of the Islamic Republican Party in its many factions and the security services. Um, we know that uh, uh, Israeli spying worked well. This is, if you like, the Cold War part of this. Uh, Stuxnet, um, which um, reportedly ruined one fifth of Iran's nuclear centrifuges, didn't happen by accident. I know that uh, technically it was that, uh, it was a malware that worked, and a lot of work had been done um, on computers outside Iran. But there is there are reports that at some stage a USB with this uh, virus 
was attached to a desktop in one of the nuclear plants. So presumably this wasn't done by anybody, but by somebody connected to the country. Now, uh, even boasting about uh, being behind Stuxnet, Israel. Um, we've also, um, we know that there's been a series of in incidents in Iran's nuclear plants. And again, um, um, it's not just that these incidents happened and therefore uh, there was some involvement um, by, according to Cohen, quite proudly, he says, we stole 30 documents up from 32 locations. Cohen is the outgoing Mossad director, 32 locations by non-Israeli agents. And by non-Israeli agents, I think he's referring to the fact that they were actually Iranians. So they stole these documents that gave them information. And from that information, they managed uh, quite a bit of destructive activities. And um, Israel and its allies, the West, will tell you that, oh, we know what we are doing. We are so good at this kind of thing. Of course, these were accurate. No lives were in danger. But anyone who knows anything about the nuclear industry would tell you that this is madness to actually uh, try and um, if you like, set fire to bits of a nuclear plant is playing with a very dangerous material that can have repercussions, not just for Iran, not just for its neighbors, but for a very wide area of the region. Uh, I think if uh, any other country had messed around with the nuclear industry of another country, and it wasn't Israel involved, we would have heard a lot more about it, about rogue states, terrorism, and so on. So I don't think we should underestimate those. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the claims by um, uh, Mossad and um, both uh, UNESCO and um, oh, um, uh, Cohen goes further and he claims that explosions in Natan's nuclear uh, facility were um, probably their work. He also almost claims, although he doesn't actually uh, say it uh, out loud, but he claims uh, the um, assassination of Fahri Zadeh. Fahri Zadeh was a nuclear physicist. He was involved in the program for Iran's nuclear industry. There is no doubt about that. He probably was associated with the uh, past Iran. We don't know the Revolution Guard. He was certainly close to the regime. But the information, irrespective of how they killed him, there are so many bizarre stories. I don't even want to go there. But irrespective of how that was done, the intelligence about his movement must have come from people very close to him within the Revolutionary Guards, within the Iranian security services. And the Cohen interview is into interesting in that it almost boasts about this. It almost says it was us without saying, of course, Israel did this. And again, as much as I dislike the Iran's Revolutionary Guards, and the Islamic Republic, uh, it doesn't really say much about the uh, world superpower and its first, most closest military ally in the region. So how does Israel find these spies? I think partly it is uh, uh, maybe anti uh, fatigue of anti-US slogans, there is an element of that. There is also, in that this anti-US slogans means nothing, it's become, if you like, I don't know, it's a bit like Boris lying. I mean, everyone knows he lies and everyone knows Iran says I'm anti-US, but it's not doing anything serious about it. I don't know, but the young Iranians don't believe it and don't believe the anti-Israeli slogan. But there is also a section of young population in Iran who are pro-Israel. And, and here again, it is the first the duplicity of the regime, its false characteristics, but also the fact that there is a massive propaganda going on by 
uh, exiled media, but even by sections of the left who can't think beyond the slogans of the right. They've been so, um, if you like, ingratiated in the current media bubble of the right that inadvertently, even when they're talking about issues such as Israel, they might talk the same language, the same um, uh, uh, vocabulary as the extreme right in Iran. And that in itself causes problems. But I also think that um, some young Iranians blame the political uh, uh, slogans, the political positioning of the state for the economic situation. They believe that the nuclear program uh, is uh, to show off and to show off against Israel. And therefore, they equate this with the, with the terrible economic situations they are facing, with sanctions, with poverty, with low wages. Some of which I would say is true. But on the other hand, any other country in the region or beyond the region, as much involved in neoliberal capital as uh, Iran, and in the position of Iran, not an advanced capitalist country, faces similar positions, similar situations, minus the uh, financial penalties of sanctions. So for many young Iranians, the hope is that sanctions will go away and then everything will be okay. Or Iran joins various economic uh, deals and then everything will be okay. Uh, no doubt things will, will not be as bad as they are now, but uh, I think that's simplistic to say that. The propaganda that I mentioned is part of the Cold War. The US does it, Britain does it to a certain extent. Israel and Saudi Arabia are the most aggressive because at least Britain has still got in its uh, format of uh, BBC uh, impartiality, one left, one center, one right, or at least sometimes one left, one center, one right to talk about Iran. But uh, the pro-Saudi TV stations that broadcast extensively to Iran, the pro-Israeli uh, TV stations that started often as uh, producers of uh, uh, series uh, translated to Persian to attract the audience and only showed their political character after they had hooked people to these trashy serial TV programs uh, are much more uh, op aggressive. Aggressive in that there's only two opinions expressed in these types of TV stations, royalists or mujahideen. Mujahideen being a religious cult uh, that uh, I would say Iran's the equivalent of the Meanies, except they're more mad than the Meanies. Um, and Israel promotes them, despite the fact that they are supposedly a Islam, want an Islamic democratic state in Iran and royalist. So we are in a um, propaganda war, which is the Cold War, and this propaganda war is 24-7, and it has been effective. It is effective. It, I, I would argue that it has even corrupted the left, in at least in exile, but to a certain extent, the left in Iran as well, where at times you hear comrades expressing their opinion about the subject, and they have listened so much to these deluded analysts that I was talking about that they are repeating the similar arguments, a similar rational thought, and that is a very serious problem. The hot war, I would say, goes to July 2021. Having said that, I mean, okay, you know, maybe I shouldn't go to the hot war. The, the hot war started in 2019, probably, and went until 2020 and then picked up again in July 2021. So we had airstrikes against the Iranian missile shipments to Iraq in uh, 2019. F-35 Israeli planes targeted uh, Iranian forces in Iraq in May 2020. There was a fire in a port on the Strait of Hormuz, and the fire was definitely set deliberately. 
then June, June, July, we saw like um, uh, explosions that happen in a number of nuclear stations, one after the other. And in all of these, um, it was quite clear that um, these were acts of sabotage. How much damage they did, I don't know, because the Islamic Republic wouldn't say, and of course, Israel wasn't claiming these as victories, but we all knew what was happening. Um, in July of 2020, we also, there was a major explosion heard all over Tehran. My relatives told me to say, well, there's a big noise going, there's a big explosion. And this was the headquarters, or one of the headquarters of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the Pastoran, that was blown up uh, near Tehran. All these activities were, if you like, at a time when Israel was thinking maybe Trump will not be in power. Trump had been a great ally. Trump had supported everything. And uh, at least Netanyahu was under the impression that if Trump um, is no longer in power after the November election, uh, things might not be so good. The, uh, Biden had talked of returning to nuclear negotiations. So there was that fear. Um, Despite all of these semi-hot hot attacks that I mentioned, Iran did not retaliate. And in some ways, they are weak. They are not in a position to retaliate. Sanctions has made them quite um, under, they are under pressure. They don't have the capability. All they can do is use proxies to do little damage here and there. And there has been the little damage, especially this summer, we'll come to that. But it's all very limited. What Iran's insurance in all this is, it's its reliance on Hezbollah in Lebanon. And to a certain extent, that does work because Hezbollah has been given land to land missiles that can reach Israeli cities. And therefore, as far as Israel is concerned, that is a threat. But on the other hand, um, clearly, even if that scenario is within the thoughts of some leaders within the Islamic Republic, they're either too scared or too clever or too uh, conservative to use it. So, so far, none of this has been used. The hot war of July 2021, I'm sure Moshe will say a lot more about it, but what I want to uh, emphasize is the first, uh, 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 there are many events, there are lots of small skirmishes in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf, Arab Gulf, whatever you call it. There's been a lot of skirmishes, but the two significant incidents of 3rd of July 21, when an Israeli cargo ship was attacked by unknown weapon, the suspicion at the time was that this was Iran. Then in late July, the Mercer Street tanker, an Israeli uh, tanker, was attacked. Two people were killed. So far, in all the small skirmishes that I have told you, no one had died. The captain of this ship and a British citizen who was, I think, a security person there, he, they, they were killed during this attack, a drone attack. Uh, the US went ballistic. G7 issued a statement. UK foreign minister was um, uh, outraged. A British citizen had died in the hands of a drone that definitely the Islamic Republic produced. The documents they have produced um, implies that the uh, material used in this could have come from Iran. Iran denies it, Iran is probably lying, but it could also be one of Iran's proxies who um, set off this drone. So the Houthis could be responsible, maybe Iraqi groups. Um, Iraqi groups have been involved, pro-Iranian Iraqi groups have been involved in many rocket attacks have, that have had no effect, but have been uh, 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 shot at US bases in the last 12 months. None of them have had much 
you you haven't even heard about them unless you were listening to Iranian Farsi speaking media. But in general, this event in late July escalated to a situation where um, the blame was put directly on Iran. The Biden administration uh, blamed Iran. Uh, as I said, G7 issued a statement. And um, as a result of this, Israel is now saying that if the US, if the nuclear deal don't go through, but there are implications that even if it does go through, Israel wants a war, wants to go to war with Iran. Um, I'm not sure on what basis, I'm not sure how these things work, but that's the, that's the position we are in. And um, I'm sure Moshe will have a lot more to say about it. The Iranians are taking this very calmly. I, I think they are mistaken to take it too calmly. Um, the insurance I talked to you about, Hezbollah, is, in my opinion, no longer the kind of support the Islamic Republic could rely on as it was in uh, to early 2000s. Why do I say this? Um, I think Hezbollah of early 2000s that did win a war, uh, the only war any um, Arab group has won against Israel, is a different Hezbollah from today. Hezbollah is now part of a complicated economic system. It is part of the neoliberal econ economy of a failed state, the Lebanese state. It is, um, it is no longer the if you like radical, just the, it has radicals in the south of Lebanon, but if you look at its supporters in Beirut, they are the modern young um, people who are into the economic, uh, uh, who were in the economic boom of uh, Lebanon and now are in the economic slump of a failed state. So relying on Hezbollah, um, is problematic for Iran, not only because of the uh, uh, serious problems that exist in Lebanon itself, the fact that the whole um, sectarian nature of the government is being questioned, the sectarian uh, divide of wealth and power is being questioned, but also because Hezbollah of today is not the Hezbollah of the early years. I might be wrong and others might be um, might tell me differently. But also, I think there is another threat that uh, uh, is a serious threat um, against Iran's Islamic Republic, and that's its own government. Its own government is uh, presiding over, over chaos. And that is more of a problem than um, for it, for its survival, for its continuation in power, is uh, more of a challenge than foreign intervention. Foreign intervention will not come, um, despite what royalists and the Mujahideen wish, in the form of US intervention or Western intervention. Look, uh, uh, look at Kabul. Uh, do I have to say any more? I mean, there are people joking that if the US gets rid of the mullahs today, they will come back 20 years later and they'll be even more popular by then, which is a disaster scenario. I don't think that's true because I think in Iran, people are really the one thing that people are finished with, even in the rural area, is religious states. They might be religious, but a religious state can't come back. But Intervention by the United States or the West is out of the question. As I've said before, and I've quoted Badio on this, but I would repeat it, the current policy of the United States in the Middle East is not occupation, intervention, in, or exploitation of the working class. It's scorch earth policy. And for that scorch earth policy, both Israel and Saudi Arabia can be very useful. The way they are useful is to increase the tensions, to create more problems in the country, and uh, to, um, if you like, help uh, create a divided Iran. If they can be part of that, and they both want to be part of that, there are long-term benefits for them and the United States. So imagine Iran as the country becomes four countries, five countries. 
then the problem that was Iran, not just the Islamic Republic of Iran, but Iran, will be in some ways resolved. And in this, both Israel and Saudi Arabia are actively working. The problem, though, isn't these two. The problem remains the Islamic Republic, because endemic corruption had not been introduced in Iran by Israel or Saudi Arabia. It is the rulers of the Islamic Republic that have created this situation. Water shortages that led to the protests of two weeks ago, last week in Khuzestan province, and then spread all over the country, is the direct result of the environmental policies of the government, but also this concept that the Iranian clergy has, that the quicker you can make large buck, the better it is. And even by the standards of capitalism, their short-termism in terms of accumulating large wealth in a very uh, astronomic wealth in a short period is unbelievable. For people who believe in the 12th Imam coming and saving the world, I'm not sure why they're so um, avarous in terms of uh, accumulating huge wealth, but they are. And, and that in itself has created the disasters that we see. And of course, in the middle of a pandemic, we are talking of a country where Corona is apparently in its fifth state and major cities are reporting the fact that there aren't enough beds. Um, the numbers the government produces are not correct, but even according to those figures, Iran is in the top 10 in terms of people who lost their lives because of Corona as people who uh, caught the virus and died. And so we are talking of a, of a disastrous internal situation, which can help um, Israel uh, in its Cold War, uh, but it also still, in my opinion, relies in inciting Iran to do something, either by another explosion in a refinery, by kill, assassinating someone or something, to do something that would justify a military intervention. This time by Israel, at this stage, I can't see the United States getting involved. However, if Israel is involved in, an, in a war with Iran, then any US government, including the Biden administration, might get involved in order to defend the ally in the Middle East. I leave it here because I think Moshe will have a lot more important and maybe more newer setup, uh, more up to date setup things to say. Thank you. To add, uh, but I, I would nevertheless like to make uh, 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 two points. Um, one is that quite obviously, and, and I've been stressing it for many years now, I mean, in, in previous communist universities or, or forums of this kind, I've been saying that the uh, uh, attitude of Israel towards Iran is much more extreme than that of the United States. In other words, the, the Israel and the United States, uh, uh, although they, they are in, in uh, uh, an alliance, obviously, and Israel is the favorite local uh, ally of the United States, uh, their interests, uh, as far as Iran is concerned, are not the same. Uh, uh, put very simply, uh, from the point of view of the United States, it is not excluded that it will uh, come to some accommodation with Iran. It depends on conditions. Now, of course, these conditions have to be acceptable to both sides. And uh, uh, what is acceptable is variable in time. I mean, the, the, the worse, the more dire the situation in Iran becomes, the, this affects uh, the terms one way or another that it uh, may uh, be prepared to settle for. As far as Israel is concerned, there is no uh, a, a likely uh, set of terms that would be acceptable uh, as far as we can see now to both the United States and Iran to make some kind of accommodation that would be welcomed by Israel. It would be 
a, a very, a, a, let us say, very unwelcome, uh, to put it very mildly for Israel, if Iran and, and the United States come to an accommodation. And this is because Iran is conceived by Israel as one, the worst actually, uh, um, the obstacle to uh, Israeli complete hegemony in the region. Now, there, there are two major powers apart from Israel in the, in the uh, uh, Middle East, in the, in the uh, near vicinity, uh, that uh, are a, a, a serious uh, potential, um, let us say, rivals of Israeli hegemony. One is Turkey, uh, obviously, but Turkey is a member of NATO and Israel can't do very much about it. It, has, it, has, it is something that Israel has to accept. It has accepted uh, uh, the uh, fact that Turkey is, is there. It, cannot, uh, it, 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 it is not trying to undermine uh, the, uh, uh, the Turkish state. I mean, it's, the, the, this is not at the moment, it is not uh, in the horizon. So it is uh, uh, more or less acceptable. Anyway, the Turkey, Turkey is looking elsewhere. It's not, it, 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 the, the, its, its activities does not seriously clash with uh, uh, what Israel conceives to be its interests in the, in the region. Uh, the, uh, uh, very different situation is, is the, the one with respect to Iran. Now, don't listen to the, the rubbish that uh, Israeli propaganda puts out that Israel is afraid of being destroyed by Iranian nuclear bomb. Israel is a major nuclear power. It has uh, 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 hundreds of nuclear uh, 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 warheads, including uh, uh, hydrogen bombs. Uh, it, it, there is no conceivable way in which Iran can, can dare to uh, try to destroy Israel. And all this talk, I mean, uh, you, you can, you, even, even the uh, most extreme uh, talk of, you know, of the likes of uh, Ahmadinejad uh, uh, mentioning the destruction of Israel, it doesn't say that we are going to destroy Israel. It, 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 it says that Israel, Israel's fate is to be uh, uh, the, the same as that of the former Soviet Union, uh, that it will collapse for various reasons. But uh, there, there, there is no real threat of, of Iran uh, uh, attacking uh, Israel, uh, uh, let alone by uh, uh, nuclear weapons. But uh, Iran is a, a rival of uh, uh, Israel's hegemony in the region. That is, that is undoubtedly true. And therefore, uh, Israel uh, 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 would like to provoke a, a war with Iran. What I, I differ from Yasmin, uh, uh, as far as what, what I heard in uh, her last part of, of, of her talk, uh, she said that Israel may actually try to uh, start a war um, without getting an Ameri a previous American authorization. I rather doubt it. The last time Israel started the war without getting uh, uh, American approval in advance was a long time ago, a lo very long time ago. It was, uh, 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 I think, 65 years ago in the, in the uh, uh, Suez War. The Suez War was the last time Israel went to war, initiated the war, and that was in alliance with uh, uh, Britain and France. Uh, that, was, that was the last time. It, since then, the, there is no way in which, I don't think that, that it is very likely, but uh, what uh, certain uh, politicians in Israel are trying to do is to provoke a situation whereby the United States may allow Israel to go to war with Iran, with, and it cannot do it without America, not only political support, but also logistic support. Uh, there, there, is, there is no other way. And, and by, by the way, uh, uh, considering it, uh, 
uh, no one uh, sane uh, would contemplate a ground war against Iran and an actual invasion of Iran. I mean, this is, you know, in this, in this day and age, and, and considering the actual logistic uh, uh, realities, this is not on. Uh, it, it, what, what is on is a uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, technological war using drones and, and missiles and possibly air bombing but not uh, a, a ground invasion and this is this is really not on i mean uh, today of all days you know having having seen the 20 years war the longest war in american history uh, come to this ignominious conclusion i think i think anyone who thinks of invading iran must be really you know out of this you know uh, out of the world of the same uh, okay so Israel has actually been provoking, and, and make no mistake about it, the, the uh, uh, Israeli press, and I, I, I would like to quote uh, a, a very good, one of the best informed uh, and forthright Israeli uh, uh, commentators in Haaretz, Tzvi Barel. I highly recommend reading his analysis. He's very well informed, and and uh, uh, I would pay attention to uh, what he writes. Well, he says when he starts from January two thousand and ten, when unknown. I'm quoting him. Unknown. That's an article uh, published uh, uh, what eleven days ago, twelve days ago, on the fourth of August. Uh, uh, unknown persons parked a booby-trapped motorcycle near the car of the Iranian nuclear scientist Masoud al-Muhammadi. The motorcycle exploded and the scientist was killed. That was the first known assassination that began a series of assassinations attributed to the Mossad. Now, uh, he uses uh, this, this uh, 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 cliche formula attributed to the Mossad. This is uh, an Israeli uh, 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 cliche uh, to get around the prohibition of the censor. Israel, uh, 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 Israeli press is, is subject to censorship. An Israeli uh, um, journalist is not allowed to write that Israel did such and such without, uh, ex uh, uh, with some very rare exception. The Israeli journalist complained. You see, you see, you see uh, the foreign press says such and such. Uh, people in the whole world know or are told by uh, uh, the BBC or New York Times that Israel did such and such, and we are not allowed to report it. So they, they came to an agreement. The censorship and the, the, uh, the, the government behind it said, yes, you, can, uh, you, are, you are allowed to report that the BBC said such and such or the uh, New York Times. And this has become a formula. When an Israeli journalist says foreign foreign sources say such and such, or such and such an action was attributed to Israel, that means that they, they agree that it was, but, but they are not allowed to say it. So uh, 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 this assassination that began a series of assassinations attributed to the Mossad, meaning Mossad did it. That's what, that was his implied. It was followed uh, in 2010 by an explosion in revolutionary Guard base in, in uh, Koramabad, in which uh, 18 Iranian soldiers were killed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He said then, uh, uh, since then, there have been hundreds of assassinations, bombings, and sabotage in Iranian nuclear installations, cyber attacks on electricity installations and trains, and of course, aerial attacks uh, on Iranian bases and facilities in Syria all of which have been attributed to Israel, okay? Attributed to Israel, meaning I, Tzvi Barel, say that Israel did it, but I'm not allowed to say. Um, uh, aside from isolated Iranian responses, Iran conducted its war against Israel by means of emissaries, and this confirms what I heard uh, uh, Yasmin say, uh, uh, by proxy. First of all, first of, and foremost by Hezbollah, uh, the Iranian attacks against Israel-owned ship in April 
the attack in early July and the attack last Thursday against the ship Mercer Street in the Gulf of Oman mark a significant strategic change, direct attacks against Israeli targets. So he's attributed these attacks directly to Iran, not to proxies. He's fairly well informed, so I, I think you know, he, he may well be right. Um, now, this, this fact that it was Iran uh, 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 who, who is sort of actually been uh, uh, directly behind it, uh, it, it was described uh, here by another uh, Israeli uh, uh, writer in Haaretz again, uh, who is this this time? Uh, Amos uh, Harel, who is well informed, uh, not so forthright. I mean, his, his analysis and views are not so uh, 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 really penetrating as Svi Barel, but he is uh, the, the military correspondent of our so, so he is uh, uh, he's supposed to be well well informed of thinking in, in, in among the Israeli military elite. He's probably, you know, sort of uh, friendly with uh, a few of the top generals in Israel. And he says, Iranian drone attack, referring to one of the latest uh, that I just mentioned, gave Israel an unexpected gift. So the, the, the uh, implication is, and th this, is, this is again uh, now becoming very obvious, that Israel is trying to provoke the war. What is happening, uh, uh, what has been happening so far in Israel is described as the war between the wars. Israel has periodic wars, you know, since uh, 1948, there have been several wars in which Israel was involved, uh, uh, five, six, seven wars. So war in which Israel is involved is a periodic thing uh, as far as the Israeli public are concerned. But the, between any two major wars, there is always hostilities that Israel is now calling a war between wars. Uh, it's not a cold war. It's not a cold war. It is, it is a, a, a low intensity war. I think this is what, how you can describe it. It is a, it is a low profile war. Israel is, is, is desperately trying to provoke a, a war. A, responsible and well-informed correspondents in Israel say that this is, this is a, 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 an adventurous uh, tactic and it is not going to work. That behind the scenes, the United States is, is strongly restraining Israel and refusing to be uh, drawn into this uh, 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 kind of adventure. Uh, I think it, with the present mood in the United States, it, 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 it would be very strange if, if uh, the Biden administration would let Israel loose and allow it to, to get, you know, get itself. So yeah, Yasmin was right. If Israel gets involved deeply in a, in a real war with Iran, the United States would, would be bound to uh, come to its help in some way. Uh, I, I think the Biden administration is very unlikely to, to welcome such a, a situation. So they are trying to restrain it. This is, this is the implication. But what is the, the sort of long-term uh, aim of this kind of war? Well, again, uh, quoting a, a recent uh, article that was published, this time not in Haaretz. I'm quoting from an article that was published also on the 4th of August, so very recent, 12, 12 days ago. It was published by uh, 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 an Israeli retired uh, uh, high-ranking uh, uh, military person uh, the writer is let, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Mordechai Kedar, uh, who is described as a senior researcher associate, uh, research associate of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. He served for 25 years 
in the IDF, in the Israeli military intelligence, specializing in Syria, Arab political discourse, Arab mass media, Islamic groups, etc., etc. So he's a, he's a sort of one of the uh, 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 experts of the Israeli intelligent, uh, com intelligence community, as it is referred. The title of his article is Dismantle Iran Now. I mean, the, the, the plan he is proposing is to break Iran up uh, according to ethnic uh, 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 divisions. It is, I'm quoting, it is important to know that despite widespread opposition to the Islamic regime among Iranians of Persian descent, they oppose the demand of ethnic minorities for this engagement from Iran. It, indeed, when I raised in meetings with Persian Iranian exiles the possibility that Iran would be partitioned into ethnic national states, Persians, Arabs, Baluchis, Kurds, Turkmen, etc., similar to what happened in the USSR, Yugoslavia, and, and Czechoslovakia, their response was always completely negative. They aspire to remove the Ayatollahs from power, but some even speak of the return of the Shah San and the renewal of the monarchy, but they unequivocally support Iran's continued existence in its current form, which postulates Iran, a Persian control of the country, country's many ethnic minorities. However, it is quite feasible that Iran will disintegrate into ethnic states. This possibility is steadily increasing due to expanding public demands demand for independence among the non-Persian minorities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is uh, recently greater cooperation have been uh, observed among various opposition organizations that sense the end of the regime on the horizon and even the disintegration of the state. Both these goals are achievable, he says. So uh, it, this is very clear. Um, I, 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 I spare you the rest of the article. I mean, he goes on in this way, in this vein, it says, um, uh, 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 the collapse of the Ayatollah's regime and the disintegration of Iran would be a blessing, not only to the tens of millions of Iranians, but also to national minorities. The international community must therefore vigorously support the struggle, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 uh, uh, end, end game of this uh, 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 Israeli strategist is the disintegration of Iran. Let me uh, end by saying that there's nothing new about this. Uh, uh, Israeli plans to, to cause a dis an ethnic disintegration of uh, neighboring states uh, is as old as, uh, well, they, they, they go uh, as far back, at least, as the, the 1950s. Uh, for example, it is reported by Avi Schlein's uh, uh, well-known article about the, the uh, negotiations leading to the Suez War, 1956, that Ben-Gurion wanted to extend this war when they, when they were negotiating, you know, the, planning the, the attack in, in Severin in, near Paris in, in uh, the autumn of 1956. Ben-Gurion said, you know, why just top of Nasser? I mean, as we all want to do. Why not uh, do some rearrangement in the Middle East? For example, Jordan should be partitioned between Israel and Iraq. So, but the, the, the Selwyn Lloyd and, and, and the, uh, the, the French, uh, what's his name, foreign minister, said, no, 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 we are, we are all interested in this. Uh, there was, the, the, there have been, you know, similar plans with respect occasionally uh, to uh, uh, Iraq. And uh, now with Iran also, it is a longstanding strategy of Israel to try to uh, ally itself with, with uh, uh, dissatisfied ethnic minorities in the surrounding region. For example, Israel has been long uh, in, in uh, touch with the Kurdish uh, uh, parties, certain Kurdish parties. It goes back again to the, at least the 1950s uh, or, uh, or at the very latest to 1960s at the time of uh, uh, Mustafa 
Barazani, the, the founder of the Barazani sort of a, a, a present clan elite. I think his, his grandson is now, is now the, in, uh, 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 the head of the Barazani party, his grandson or great grandson. But it was Mullah Mustafa Barazani who was an ally of Israel. And Israel was sort of uh, stirring the pot at that time, of course, in, in, in Iraq because at that time, uh, uh, Iran was an ally of Israel. Uh, so, I mean, this, this is a long uh, 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 history uh, and a long history of not succeeding. Uh, it is reassuring, of course, this is no guarantee that it will not work this time, but I mean, Israel tried it in Lebanon. Oh yeah, Lebanon was one of the targets for ethnic partitioning. And uh, the structure of Lebanon is, is even more fragile in these terms than, than you know, various ethnic and, and religious uh, minorities in, in Lebanon. Um, uh, 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 Syria is another example. So uh, uh, the, these plans are not anything new and they're part of a traditional uh, uh, Israeli strategic thinking, so they shouldn't be dismissed simply as the as the the uh, uh, fantasies of of a certain uh, uh, unbalanced, uh, let us say, military uh, uh, intelligence veteran. That's that's all I have to say.